it's really indeed a pleasure to have been asked to introduce uh, my friend, Dr. Pigney. Uh, I had the uh, honor of introducing Dr. Uh, Hercules Pigney in 2010 when he was named by Leadership Montgomery as County Leader of the Year. In fact, this breathtakingly beautiful building, the Bioscience Education Center, is one of the fruits of his leadership. This innovative LEED Gold Building and the Hercules Pinckney Life Science Park are results of his vision his and his inspiring leadership. It's no wonder that uh, he has, was appointed three consecutive terms by the governor to serve on the Maryland Science Advisory Board. How fitting is it that Holy Cross Germantown Hospital will be opening in just a few weeks? Yet another aspect of Hercules Pinckney's, Pinckney's life science park and Dr. Pinckney's incredible vision. And how fitting it is also that these buildings and parks are part of Montgomery College, where Dr. Pinckney served as an inspiring leader in his role as vice president and provost of the Germantown campus and president of, Mo of Montgomery College. And how fitting it is that the inaugural talk in the Bioscience Education Center is given by none other than Dr. Pinckney. While many of you know Dr. Pickney and his and one or more of these current leadership roles, many of us are not fully aware of his role in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. The topic of tonight's lecture. In 1963, Martin Luther King visited Caffin College in Orangeburg, South Carolina, where Dr. Pickney and a freshman, as a freshman, was demonstrating through sit-ins at the World War. Woolworth lunch counters. However, Martin Luther King exhorted the Clayton students to engage in civil disobedience by kneeling down and praying whenever they were uh, forced in the, by the police, and they forced the police to arrest them. As a result, Dr. Hercules Pickney spent 10 days in jail. I didn't know you were a jailbird. <laughs> Dr. Pigna only calls himself a foot soldier in the civil rights movement. However, he went on to achieve many heights despite the obstacles of racism and prejudice. In 1967, due to his high academic standard in the federal funded master's degree program, he was selected to represent the National Teachers Corps program at the White House. At that ceremony, he shook the hand of President Johnson, the president who signed the Civil Rights Act. Over the years, Dr. Pinckney has come to accept the fact that in order for him to continue to contribute to the Civil Rights Movement, he would have to be willing to face challenges of being the first and sometimes the only African American in his family in the position and role within the academic and professional career. He was the first in his family to be awarded a doctorate degree. In fact, when he graduated in 1975 from Virginia Politic Institute and State University, a predominantly white institution, he was only the 11th African American to have been awarded the, the doctorate degree from Virginia Tech School of Education. He was the first African American continuing education administrator at the Northern Virginia Community College, Annandale Campus, the first African American community service now here at Montgomery College called the Workforce Development Continuing Education Administration, and the first African American vice president and provost of Montgomery College Germantown Campus. Additionally, he was the first African-American chair of the board of directors of the Germantown Gaithersburg Chamber of Commerce. And I am proud to say he is the first African-American for whom a life science research park has been named anywhere in the United States. We are truly privileged to have Dr. Pinckney talk to us tonight about the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act his personal reflection. You are please help me welcome Dr. Pinckney, an inspirational leader, and my friend, Hercules. <laughs> Uh, 
First, I want to thank Saul for that generous introduction. And um, you know the feeling is mutual. I'm, I'm proud to call you my friend. Um, it's always a pleasure to return to Montgomery College, an outstanding institution of higher education, where I had the privilege of culminating a 43-year career in education. The 13 plus years I spent here with extraordinary faculty, staff, and administrators were the most meaningful and far-reaching in terms of being able to help with laying the foundation for many of the accomplishments of Montgomery College that we celebrate. For instance, earlier today we celebrated the official opening of this magnificent Bioscience Education Center and Conference Center. We celebrate in just a few weeks, as uh, I think Saul mentioned, the opening of Holy Cross Germantown Hospital, the, f the new hospital, the first new hospital in Montgomery County in 35 years. And we look forward to celebrating even more as the Life Sciences Park begin to be steaming with other businesses, with student internships and employment, faculty and business interaction that will only lead to more entrepreneurial and economic development activity and successes. I would like to um, correct or at least modify something uh, Saul and a lot of other people who introduced me today uh, said. They talked about um, my vision and, and what I did. Uh, I did not do it. It was a team. And I can recall very vividly when the opportunity came to the college to uh, embark on this wonderful vision of having a, a business park on the campus, an incubator on the campus, and this new uh, facility. I went to a dean and I said, I need you to write a paper. I want it to be your big dream. And she wrote that paper and that was the genesis of the work we did and just kept adding to that big dream paper. And the person that wrote that big dream paper is Kathy McKay. And Kathy, please stand. Thank you. I'm especially pleased on this occasion to be back home. So I'd like to thank Professor Joan Nate for the kind invitation to share my personal reflections regarding the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I also wish to extend my sincere appreciation to the media staff and others here at Montgomery College Germantown campus and a family friend, Neil Martin, for all of the technical support they've given me. Anniversaries of significance of significant occurrences such as 9-11, the 1963 March on Washington, the end of two world wars, and any time we have landmark legislation. All of these events elicit reflection and memorial events to commemorate their importance. I'm privileged to have been asked to comment on one such anniversary, and that is the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. However, before we begin to share my personal reflections, I invite you to experience the moments leading up to the actual signing of the legislation by President Lyndon Johnson. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We must not approach the observance and enforcement of this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. Its purpose is national, not regional. Its purpose is to promote a more abiding commitment to freedom, a more constant pursuit of justice, and a deeper respect for human dignity. My fellow citizens, we have come now to a time of testing. We must not fail. Let us close the springs of racial poison. Let us pray for wise and understanding hearts. Let us lay aside irrelevant differences and make our nation whole. Let us hasten that day when our unmeasured strength and our unbounded spirit will be free to do the great works ordained for this nation by the just and wise God who is the Father of us all. Thank you and good night. I'm sure you noticed that Dr. Martin Luther King was not only there, but he received one of the pens that the president used to sign the act. In its broadest sense, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned the following institutionalized, I would call them, uh, what? They ban such things as discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. It also banned unequal application of voter registration laws and racial segregation in schools, the workplace, and places of public accommodation. From today's perspective, Prohibition against these humiliating practices are commonplace, at least from a legal perspective. These prohibitions are indeed the law of the land. Therefore, to appreciate the significance of the act, we must take a journey back in our history to understand some of the major factors leading to the need for such legislation. Why was the Civil Rights Act needed? But how far back in our history should we go? What or where would be a good starting point? And what are some of the milestone events leading up to and immediately after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? I suggest that we begin with the institution of slavery. This was such a prevalent institution in our beloved America for some through 245 years, beginning with the sale of the first slave in 1619 and the last finally freed in 1865. And just what is the institution of slavery? It can best be described as one in which African Americans were viewed and treated as less than human. In fact, we were considered property.
To make matters worse, slavery was actually legalized through the passage of a series of laws that perpetuated the lowly status of African Americans. In this system, there was no legal recourse against inhuman treatment, such as brutal beatings, torture, rape, dismemberment. And slaves were forced to labor hours and hours without pay. In other words, human rights did not exist for slaves. It was even against the law for slaves to learn to write and read. To illustrate the depth of how institutionalized slavery was, I want to tell you about a slave named Drew Scott. He first went to court and sued to be freed in 1847. Ten years later, after a decade of appeals and court reversals, his case was finally brought before the United States Supreme Court in what is perhaps the most infamed case in the history of the court. The court ruled that all people of African uh, ancestry, slave or free, could not ever become a citizen of the United States and therefore could not sue in federal court. More devastating was the fact that the court also ruled that the federal government did not have power to prohibit slavery in the territories of the country. This was truly a period of strong states' rights, and needless to say, Drew Scott remained a slave. While the Supreme Court decision was chaired by Southern slaveholders, many Northerners were outraged. The decision greatly influenced the nomination of Abraham Lincoln to the Republican Party. <clears throat> and his subsequent election, which in turn led to the secession of the Union of many of 11 states. The son of a former slave owner who became childhood friends with Drew Scott had helped to pay his legal fees over the years. After the Supreme Court decision, the former master's sons purchased Scott and his wife and set them free. Sadly, Drew Scott died just nine months later. It would take a civil war and a brave president to free the slaves. The 1863 proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, gave hope for the first time to African Americans that they would finally be free, free to be educated, free to exercise their newfound right to vote, and to enjoy equal rights in the courts, but most importantly, freedom to own land. Emancipation brought such high hopes. However, after nearly 250 years of institutionalized slavery, the law of the land that abolished slavery did not change the hearts of former slave owners, particularly in the South. In attempts to hold on to the past, another series of laws called Jim Crow laws took the place of the slave laws. This ushered in an era when state and local laws in the United States actually mandated racial segregation in all public facilities in southern states of the former Confederacy with separate but equal status for African Americans. Separate, but hardly equal. The Jim Crow era was also one in which unfair sharecropping 
practices rose to prominence in which former slave owners indentured former slaves to work their land. But they set up situations in which they could never make enough to satisfy their indebtedness. This was also aided by the fact that African Americans who couldn't read and write did not understand the agreements in which they were engaged. This kept African Americans, many of them, on the plantations. Former masters were able to get away with many injustices because Jim Crow laws, as well as other factors, just made it impossible for African Americans to make it a movement. However, from generation to generation, African Americans began to build their own schools and colleges and to take up law and trades. And eventually, a middle class of African Americans evolved in the United States. But this was seen by Southern whites as a direct threat to their supremacy. Therefore, they added terror to their arsenal of intimidation and suppression. This was illustrated most by the blatant racism and the mob lynchings of the Ku Klux Klan and other white Southern mobs that violated the civil rights and it really took away the lives of African Americans. And they did it without accountability or punishment. While these horrible happenings created severe disappointments, there kept appearing to be glimmers of hope. For instance, during Reconstruction, the Freedman's Bureau was established and this was established to distribute aid and abandon land that resulted from the Civil War. This was the period in which we also had the passage of the 13th Amendment, barring slavery. The 14th Amendment that addressed citizenship rights and equal protection under the law. And the 15th Amendment that granted African American men the right to vote but true freedom for former slaves remain elusive. While there are many other milestones that we could cover justifying the need for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I would like us to fast forward now to the early 50s and 60s. This is the point in time where I would like to begin to share some of my personal reflections. I call the 1954 to 1964 period in our civil rights history the decade of activism. You won't find that in any book. I made it up. <laughs> Along with becoming more educated, African Americans also became more assertive in expressing their second class treatment in America. Our first major civil rights victory came in 1954 when the Supreme Court of the United States in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education declared separate but equal unconstitutional. Segregation in public schools was no longer legal in our country. The following year, in December 1955, Rosa Parks refused to obey a bus driver's order that she give up her seat in the colored section of the bus to a white man because the white section was filled. Her refusal because of her refusal, she was arrested. Park's act of defiance and the subsequent Montgomery bus boycott became an important symbol and rallying point of the modern civil rights movement. At an early age, as I experienced the everyday 
life of segregation in the South. I first was inspired by my faith that unfair treatment of blacks in America, and especially the inhumanity of Southern whites toward African Americans, were to me just plain immoral. This sense of unfairness stirred me with an uneasiness for which I sought a way to express my frustration with the status quo. While I cannot pinpoint the exact date or even the circumstances, I know that somewhere along my young life's journey, I became convinced that a good education would be my best opportunity to help change conditions of African Americans for the better. I remember our teachers throughout high school hammering home the point that we needed to prepare ourselves for the day when segregation would end in America. They set very high academic standards for us and gave us extra work and assignments that we could use to add to our grade point averages. It was not enough, they would tell us, to be in the top 10% of our class. They wanted us to strive to be in the top three of our academic class. Back in the day, being a nerd was cool. <laughs> By the time I entered college in 1962, separate but equal was still the law of the land in spite of the 1954 Supreme Court decision. But generations have now passed since slavery was abolished in America and the rise of Jim Crow. By now, many African Americans have become not only well educated, but much more impatient and assertive in demands for equal treatment under the Constitution of the United States of America. There was increasing unrest in the country, especially in the South over many issues related to segregation and unequal treatment under the Constitution. No one was more eloquent or persuasive than the young Baptist preacher by the name of Martin Luther King, Jr. in articulating those injustices. And while anger was on the rise within many black communities, Dr. King advocated peaceful demonstrations and legal remedies to address our grievances. i had seen Dr. King on television, and he appeared undaunted, unafraid of those bigoted police with billy clubs and dogs and firemen with fire hoses. He seemed to be arrested and rearrested for peaceful demonstrations. But he was portrayed in the media as a lawbreaker and as one who incited unrest. Oh, but when I heard him talk, I immediately sensed the disparities between what I read and what I saw on television and what the man was really about. However, many of, of my friends felt that to follow Dr. King's nonviolent movements, was to be less than a man. They said things like, a real man wouldn't stand silently while being yelled at, called despicable names, being spat upon, or being knocked down by the force of water from firemen's hoses, or being threatened with attack dogs of the police, or being arrested just for walking down the street with a picket sign. I have to admit, for a while I was torn. I reasoned that I could probably withstand the yelling, the name calling, maybe the water hoses, and being arrested. But I paused and wondered how I'd react if someone spat in my face. 
Well, Dr. King's methods won me over because they were compatible with my religious upbringing and my strong family values. He was the type of speaker who could just make you feel like you were empowered to change the status quo and help make America a better place for all its citizens. Then, in the spring of 1963, I was nearing the end of my freshman year at Claflin College, a small Methodist-supported college in Orangeburg, South Carolina, when I was privileged to hear Dr. King speak in person. I was walking across campus one day, and I noticed a crowd gathering around the bandstand. We didn't have smartphones, so we couldn't text each other. <laughs> and so everything was by sight or word of mouth. And we knew something of significant was happening because everybody was gathering. By the time I reached the bandstand, I had to take my place about four rows back in the crowd, away from the speakers. And we had heard rumors about FBI informants and police undercover people infiltrating the rallies of the civil rights folk. And as I stood intent to hear Dr. King, I noticed a man in a black suit standing next to me, very quiet and unassuming. The cadre of speakers thrilled us with reports of the progress and effectiveness of the nonviolent demonstrations throughout the South and plans for future larger demonstrations and civil disobedience and legal efforts. After a series of speakers, the fourth speaker came forward to begin to introduce Dr. Martin Luther King. Just about every two minutes, we would break out in applause because of the accolades given to Dr. King for his bravery, his vision, and his leadership. But I noticed that every time we would applause and whistle, this gentleman next to me just stood there with his hands in front of him. And I just shook my head. So the speaker continues to introduced Dr. King, and you have to understand that most of the people that traveled with Dr. King and introduced him were preachers. And Southern preachers are very long-winded. <laughs> so it wasn't unusual to hear a 20-minute introduction. And so we listened and waited because we wanted to hear Dr. King himself. The guy next to me still didn't seem impressed. So I got a little upset. So by the fifth time that we gave Dr. King this very triumphant ovation, I turned to the guy and I just did one of these. <laughs> At that moment, the speaker in a louder and louder voice said, and now here is our leader, the one who will take us to the promised land, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> we erupted in chairs and whistling, and we were jumping up and down, and I was looking through the crowd trying to see him. And then I noticed these hands just over the heads of the crowd, and I'm still trying to see him. And all of a sudden, his hands go down. And as they go down, the noise goes down until you could almost hear a pin drop. And I looked. And my mouth dropped because the guy standing next to me was Dr. King. <laughs> now, 
for, for the few people that I told this to besides you, they asked me, how could you not recognize Dr. King? Well, I'm going to tell you what I told them. Television made his cheeks look <laughs> puffier and made him look taller than what he appeared next to me. So when I think back on that today about that chance encounter where I had the opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with the most famous and effective and greatest civil rights leader, the youngest Nobel Prize recipient, and all I had to say to him was, duh. <laughs> Back to his speech that day, he told us that he wanted us to take our demonstrations to another level. But well, we as students had already done so. We were not only marching, we had begun sitting in at lunch counters, and particularly in Orangeburg, there was a Woolworth department store. But Dr. King wanted us to not only do those things, he told us that he wanted us to engage in civil disobedience. He wanted us, whenever we were told to stop and disperse, to kneel right there and pray and force the police to arrest us. And so we walked away from that speech determined to follow our leader. So we demonstrated every day that week and the jails began to fill up. And Around the third day, uh, I had not yet been arrested, and my parents said to me, I don't want you to demonstrate anymore because you may be killed or seriously injured. But I couldn't get Dr. King's speech out of my mind. One night as I was trying to fall asleep, I had visions of what I'd seen on the news police beating demonstrators, releasing attack dogs on protesters, farming, knocking down black marches. I prayed that night like I'd never prayed before for strength to follow through with my personal commitment to help make a difference for the future, particularly for my future children and their children. The next day, I and seemingly every other student who had not been jailed yet entered the campus and we started marching down the streets in Orangeburg, South Carolina. When we got downtown, we started being booed and jeered by young and old whites on the opposite side of the street. The Orangeburg police ordered us to disperse or be arrested. I did not see any dogs, but I heard them barking. We also saw the firemen who had hoses trained on us. The police chief once again held up his bullhorn and said, this is your last warning. Disperse or be arrested. Well, we thought he was bluffing because we knew the jails were already filled. And so, as the police moved in on us, we fell to our knees and began to pray. To our surprise, they didn't lead us to the local jail. They led us to buses that were waiting. And they transported us 25 miles away from Orangeburg to a state facility. We were not allowed to make any phone calls, 
So we didn't even know if anybody in Orangeburg knew where we were. After 10 days of confinement, we were finally released. To this day, I don't know where that facility is. And to this day, to my knowledge, none of us have ever been formally charged. Interestingly, and in harmony with what my high school teachers were telling us, Dr. King and other civil rights leaders and our parents began to urge us, and I'm talking about my generation of students, to obtain a good education and exercise our right to vote. We were told that we must prepare ourselves for the day when segregation and institutionalized racism would be eliminated. We each would have to be willing to be the first African Americans to take our place in formerly all white institutions and positions in business and other walks of life, no matter the cost. To be successful in this new world that we believed in our hearts would soon come, we were told that we would have to be twice as good in our knowledge and skills to have any chance of leveling the playing field for future generations of African Americans. I participated in several other demonstrations there in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and kept an eye on what was happening nationally. As seven political leaders and police cracked down on peaceful demonstrators and the repeated bombings in Birmingham, Alabama, news outlets finally began to show these atrocities on national television. As a result, more and more progressive and sympathetic people of all races began to recognize the hypocrisy of our Constitution as it related to the unfair treatment of African Americans, and they joined our movement. President Kennedy, was so moved by what he saw in the evening news following a series of protests, particularly in Birmingham, that he addressed the nation in a civil rights speech on June 11, 1963. In that speech, he said, giving all Americans, he called for legislation that would give all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public such as hotels, restaurants, theaters, and retail stores, and similar establishments, as well as greater protection for voter rights. The night in August of 1963, the March on Washington galvanized the nation in preparation for the passage of legislation that would finally cause Jim Crow to fall. We could sense victory in our grasp. But on November 23, 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Those of us in the South felt that the loss of Kennedy would mean that we had no chance of seeing any passage of civil rights legislation in the foreseeable future. But to our surprise, President Lyndon Johnson took up the cause and with the sympathy of the nation still focused on the death of President Kennedy, he addressed a joint session of Congress on my birthday, November 27, 1963, and told legislators, no memorial oratory or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest possible passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought so long. Ironically, the fiercest opposition to this bill came from Senator Strong Thurmond of my home state, South Carolina. In spite of stiff resistance from Southern Democrats, Johnson used a bully pulpit of his office of the presidency and all of his political skills to marshal enough votes to move the Civil Rights Act through both houses of Congress and sign the bill, as you saw in the video, on July 2nd, 
1964 there at the White House. This was an amazing political triumph. On the surface, you might think passing this long-awaited legislation was going to be fairly easy in light of the fact that you had a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House. However, President Johnson had to bring all of his political know-how and the very power of his office to move this landmark legislation through both houses of Congress. I recently heard a lecture by Yurin Faison, who described the political drama surrounding passage of the bill, and it goes as follows. First, the chair of the House Rules Committee, a Democrat, and also a Virginia segregationist, refused to allow the bill to clear his committee until he was threatened with a discharge position that would move the bill automatically to the floor of the House. Likewise, on the Senate side, the Senate Majority Leader, also a Democrat, had to get creative with the House rules in order to bypass the committee of a Southern segregationist that was chaired also by a Democrat. Then there was the Southern Bloc of 18 senators who filibustered the bill for 57 days. The Senate had to offer a watered down bill to gain enough votes to invoke closure to kill the filibuster. The bill then had to go to conference committee and to the White House as agreed. And of course, President Johnson signed it. In his lecture also, he shared that the following analysis of, con of how Congress vote is very telling. In the House, Democrats voted 152 to 96 for passage, while Republicans voted 138 to 34 for passage. So 80% of the Republicans compared to 61% of the Democrats voted in favor of passage. On the Senate side, Democrats voted 46 to 21 for passage, while Republicans voted 27 to 6 for passage. Therefore, 69% of Democrats versus 82% of Republicans voted in favor of passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. Another interesting way to look at how the voting played out is to analyze it by region, North versus South. Very telling. As you can see, Northern Democrats and Republicans strongly supported the bill. 98 and 84 percent, respectively. While Southern Democrats and Republicans were staunchly against the bill as reflected in their 95 and 100 percent vote in opposition to passage. Members from this group were the ones that led that 57-day filibuster. Needless to say, the majority of Americans, and especially African Americans, hailed the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 as the most significant legislation since the abolition of slavery. I wish I could report to you that the signing of the historic legislation ended our civil rights problem in America. The reality is that legislation never changes attitudes or abolishes institutionalized practices overnight. We had recent history to prove that. Ten years earlier, in 1954, the Supreme Court declared separate but equal unconstitutional and mandated public schools to be desegregated. Now, 10 years later, in 1964, only 1% of the schools in the South were desegregated. In spite of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, over the next four years, we were still demonstrating 
particularly in the South, because the Southern states and municipal governments were intentionally slow in complying with the law and sought every legal loophole to perpetuate segregation. This only made me more determined to pursue my goal of continuing my education. Two months after graduating from Clafton College, I was accepted in the National Teacher Corps. Teacher Corps was a program established by Congress to improve elementary and secondary teaching in predominantly low income areas. And we as interns worked under a master teacher in the school district while we matriculated in the evenings at a college. The particular arrangement I was in was I was working on my master's at South Carolina State College in Orangeburg, but the school district I worked in was in Sumter, South Carolina, 60 miles away. While in that program, the faculty, uh, they told me due to my academic standing, indicated that the president had invited core representatives from around the country to come to the White House to a 1967 Presidential Scholars Reception. And I was selected to represent the program at South Carolina State College. It was there as I processed through the reception line that I shook the hand of the president that signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I finally came down from that cloud when I returned home. One day en route, remember I told you I had to travel 60 miles? After work one day in Sumter, I was en route to Orangeburg, and I had four other of my classmates in the car with me. I noticed in my rearview mirror, we called them road or uh, patrolmen, highway patrolmen. I noticed a highway patrolman trailing me. And he trailed me for about three miles and I knew I wasn't speeding because I kept watching my speedometer. He finally pulled beside my car and motioned me to pull over. I did. He came to the car and he asked me for my driver's license and registration. And he did so in a relatively polite tone. So I asked, um, was there a problem? I don't think I was speeding. Well, he didn't respond directly. He asked me to come with him to his car. And so I walked back to the police cruiser with him, and I got in on the driver's side, and he immediately started spewing out obscenities, raising his voice louder and louder. And he said, who do y'all think you are? You think you're better than anybody else just because you're getting the education? Then I heard the strap on his gun holster click. I looked straight ahead. I didn't want to make eye contact. And he went on spewing these obscenities for another two minutes. I stood there, sat there silently. He finally said, you can go, your car is okay. And as I got out of the car, before I could even close the door, he sped off. Now, as horrible as that sounds, it was nothing in comparison to what happened a year later. In my hometown of Orangeburg, South Carolina, at 10.32 p.m. on the night of February 8, 1968, 
eight seconds of gunfire from police left three young black men dying and 27 others wounded on the campus of South Carolina State College. The shootings occurred two nights after an effort by the undergraduate students at the institution to bowl in the only bowling alley in Orangeburg. The owner refused. Tempers rose and violence erupted. Three young men lost their lives that night. Samuel Hammond, Delano Middleton, and Henry Smith. Delano Middleton attended and graduated from Wilkinson High School, the same high school I graduated from just two years earlier. I knew his family. The deaths of these three unarmed students marked the first time in American history that such a tragedy occurred on a college campus. And this happened two years before gunfire by the National Guardmen in Ohio killed four students at Kent State University. Now, I bet most of you know about Kent State, but how many know about the Orangeburg Massacre? Unlike Kent State, the students killed in Orangeburg were black, and the shooting occurred at night. So there were no compelling TV images, so the media had very little to show. In fact, there was so little that was shown that it barely touched the conscience of America. But we persevered. I consider myself to have been, and still, a foot soldier of the Civil Rights Movement. I was not the one who led large groups of demonstrators or made speeches to cheering crowds. I was just a participant in marches and sit-ins in my hometown of Orangeburg, South Carolina in one-on-one -on -one conversations with my parents and other adults I encouraged them to register and vote. All along the way there were many others of different races to join us across America in this national movement to rid this country of the insidious cancer of segregation and racial discrimination. We are all indebted to the countless unheralded Americans whose names will never be etched on a monumental stone or the names written on the pages of history books. But the fruits of their sacrificial labors and in some cases the loss of their very lives will be cherished always in the hearts of all Americans. That is why we do have cause to celebrate we celebrate this because it was the most sweeping legislation protecting the basic rights of minorities in this country. Major parts of the bill we can celebrate are that it banned racial discrimination because it made it illegal to do so in hotels and motels and restaurants and other places of public accommodations. It forbid discrimination in employment on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, or gender. It created the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, which was a watchdog agency that oversaw the enforcement of the act. We can also celebrate the, these parts of the act because it withheld grants from states and local governments that did not practice segregation. It strengthened voter rights legislation, and it authorized the Justice Department to initiate lawsuits to desegregate public schools and facilities. We can celebrate the fact that Congress, through its powers to regulate interstate commerce, put teeth in enforcement 
of the 11 titles under the act by withholding federal funds from violators. It is also fitting that we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because on July 2nd, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson, with the stroke of his pen, brought a triumphant culmination, as of that date, to about 150 years of the civil rights struggle. In closing, I say to you that as long as we continue to have racial profiling, police brutality, barriers to voting or discrimination in any form, we each have a role to play. So let us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by recommitting ourselves to ensuring the civil rights and dignity of every American citizen, regardless of race, color, or religion. Let us honor, respect, and uphold one another. That is our challenge and our responsibility here, right now, in, in 2014, 50 years after the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you for sharing your evening with me.